This week, we're going to talk about some of the newcomers in the cigar industry and the, the names and companies to watch in the future. So stay tuned for this edition of Stogie Geek Shorts. This is a Security Weekly production. Havana Cigar Club, located in Warwick, Rhode Island, is a great place to enjoy a drink and a cigar. Stogie Geeks listeners can find a $5 off coupon on our website by clicking the HCC logo. Welcome everyone to Stogie Geek Shorts. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. On the lines via Skype from North Carolina, Mr. Will Cooper. Welcome, Will. Hey, Paul. What's going on? We're talking about the newcomers to the cigar industry and the names and companies of uh, people and organizations that we're going to watch in the future of this industry. Yeah, and, you know, the, the really what I'm thinking about is there's a lot of companies, but who are the ones that are going to be around five years from now? And it's going to be tougher with FDA. But I think there's a lot of hope. You know, with all these, there has been a lot of new companies. And just like anything, the, it's going to be survival of the fittest. And there, are gonna be, there is going to be a fittest out there. So... Yeah, I you know, uh, as I next up in my lineup is to do startup security weekly. I think it would be interesting to to have maybe an offline conversation with with some cigar companies uh, in confidence, uh, you know, confidentiality agreement about like what's the what's the market and viability, right? Like what's the what's the investment, what's right. the return, how long does it take to to make that return, and then once we figure out what FDA is going to bring. That's an added cost, which is going to impact your return. And then we can kind of figure out like how much market traction they're going to need to have in order to survive and make it a, a viable business for them. I think FDA regulations are going to impact, could be in a small way, could be in a large way. It depends on what those fees are and how uh, well or not so well we're able to uh, use lobbying and legislation and influence to control those fees so that it can be more of an open market. Sure. Politically and fundamentally, I disagree with the government oversight in this area. There are areas where sometimes you want to call for government oversight, and government oversight has had benefits. In this area, as much as we've studied it, Will, my concern is it's going to have an impact on the newcomers. You know, I, we were just talking about Steve Saka. I, I, I love smoking uh, particularly one of Steve Saka's cigars, all of his cigars, but one in particular is my favorite. Um, and I've talked to other smaller manufacturers where I'm like, wow, like, one of your cigars is one of my regular favorites, and they're basically like, yeah, if FDA comes down with fees, like, I'm done. Like, there's no way. I'm going to go focus on other things. And so I think uh, the newcomers today, we'll see which ones survive, and we'll see what newcomers can get into the market, because now there's going to be a larger barrier to entry. Yeah, I mean, and we just talked about, you know, we were talking about earlier about Jose Blanco, like, leaving his own mm -hmm. company to go to work for E.P. Carrillo. Now, he had his wife, Emma, who could keep the ball rolling with everything he did. But imagine if he had to shut that down. He did some great blends there. That would be lost forever. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so absolutely. And I, I like your, you have uh, an assessment that as uh, FDA regulations persist, there's going to be an opportunity because re for the consumer because retailers are going to have to offload inventory. Retailers that bought some of the stock that there might be a date where it has to come off the shelves they're going to have to move it or like what happens to it? Yeah, we're going like, to see a, a, we'll see a price increase now coming up very soon. We'll start to see the price increase. But at the in, but the retail level early next, I'd say early 2018, you're going to see the clearances happen because well, if I that mean, stuff has yeah. It, it could also be that that's an opportunity. I'm not the best in international business. Probably should have paid more attention in that class in business school. But, I mean, can you create a company outside the U.S., have that company buy the stuff that you're going to surplus and then sell it in Europe or online? Well, according to Robert Caldwell, and I hope I'm not giving out any trade secret, but I don't mm -hmm. think this is. So Robert Caldwell was in Greensboro, and the retailer happened to have a bunch of last czar cigars that yep. was sitting there but robert was telling the story how there was a company in russia that was i mean there was a place in russia that was selling tons of these cigars right mm -hmm. and he basically couldn't provide this guy any more of the cigars 
So it kind of sounded like, I don't know if the transaction ever happened, but it sounded like that Robert was willing to buy some of those back from him and then distribute them into Europe. So I think the answer is it can be done. It sounded, it, it, was, it didn't sound like a joke. It sounded like it was a very real possibility. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's where we need further clarification on the FDA regulations. If they can't go on the market in the U.S., does that mean the retailer is really stuck with them, or can they sell them to another company, either in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., for sale to consumers outside the U.S.? I think, yeah, I think the answer is, because, yeah, that's, that's a very interesting point. I, I didn't think of it like that, too, is can they be, unless they have, you know, if they'll have to get to distribute right from the factory, if right. they bypass the U.S., Correct. Like, so the, the, that would be the way they have to do it, but I think you're or right. Or there's, there's distributors that are going to be setting up in 2017 to take on either surplus or new cigar brands that are going to come on the market that aren't going to be available in the U.S. because of FDA regulation. Exactly, exactly. And now, but as uh, then, it's the similar. Is it a similar situation to purchasing Cuban cigars? Like Cuban cigars are clearly illegal, but cigars that don't get FDA approval on the U.S. market, is it illegal for a U.S. citizen to go online and purchase those from a country outside and import them? I don't. I think the answer is that's not illegal. Right, far, because uh, I, 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 some friends of mine. Uh, like certain pharmaceuticals that keep them awake, you know, not like heavy duty narcotics, but there are certain pharmaceuticals uh, that uh, keep you awake. And I know people are ordering them from like India and stuff. Right. And now, like, I would, I mean, he gave me some to him. Like, I, really? I don't know if I trust that. <laughs> well, but, I, I, yeah. <laughs> but it's certainly not, I, I don't think it's illegal. I don't think it's illegal to do that. Cuban cigars are illegal because of the trade embargo makes that right. illegal. But other goods that aren't FDA regulated, you can purchase legally from the U.S. The FDA, the one thing I do know is the FDA doesn't have jurisdiction over customs. So right. it's a customs issue now. They could put, they've put some restrictions in terms of the paperwork that supposedly needs to be filed. And they could, right. they, they've had to put some things, burden on, on uh, customs. But the answer is that, you know, my answer was no originally that, because they weren't regulated. Now that they're regulated, it could be a little bit of a different story, but I think it's still a customs issue. It's going to be interesting how it changes and shapes the industry because, as you and I both know, we talk about newcomers to the industry. You and I, our listeners, and much of the cigar industry that represents the consumers are very excited about new brands and new blends. And in my estimation, from being in this community uh, very heavily for the past five years, we will go to great lengths to satisfy that need of getting the newcomers' cigars, the new blends, the new brands. Um, and I, I don't think FDA is going to... It'll impact that, but I think there is a good portion of cigar smokers out there that are still going to find ways uh, to get these cigars. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. And like we were talking about the Cuban... About you know Cubans, people being able to go to you know outside the U.S. Mm -hmm. and bring Cubans back in. Guess what? It's not just Cubans. They're going to bring back any. It's eventually when these regulations are fully kicked in. Yeah. They're they're going if they can't get Caldwell cigars here and they're traveling in Turkey or, or Moscow and they can right. get them, they're going to get them. So you have a bigger problem than Cuba right now with that. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, I think the real impact is going to be felt on the retailers, because the retailers. I mean, to varying degrees, I think are doing pretty well. If they play their cards right and they're bringing in the stuff that moves, which is, I mean, we've had whole conversations with people about that on the show. Um, if they bring in stuff that moves, those new brands and those new blends will sell really good. Your for, first order, like if you sell through that, that's great for the retailer, right? You didn't have to keep that in stock. You sold it at full retail price. That's awesome. And then you and I have also seen where, if it dies off or you brought it in and it didn't sell so well, you can put it on discount. You can still make money and still sell it uh, to your customers and move a bunch at once and still make money on that. And that, I think, largely is going to impact the retailers when we see a shift in this industry. Absolutely. I totally agree. Um, so who are some of the newcomers? I mean, I, when you say newcomers, I immediately think of Nick Melillo and Steve Saka they're not newcomers to the industry. 
their newcomers in having their own uh, brands and blends, and I believe they're both doing very well. I enjoy smoking both of uh, their cigars uh, very much, and th those are two that I think are probably some of the more significant newcomers to having their own companies and bringing their new brands and blends to the market. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly for the first time, I want to say running, you know, Steve kind of did some of it at Drew Estate, but now he's got, you know, he's now he's the head honcho, you know, you know, he's seen it, you know, so same with Nick Malello. So I think based on and those, those kind of both launched the same time last year, I think they fall into that category as well. Uh, yeah. Some of the things that may be a little bit of a disadvantage to those companies are they don't own the factories, but guys like Nick and Steve are not like if I went down to Nicaragua and had a cigar made versus Steve and Nick going mm -hmm. into a factory and having a cigar made, you know, hey, look, I'm probably going to be the guy bumped. You know what I mean? Those guys are right. not going to get bumped. So, yeah, so I, oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, some people might get bumped. I think also yeah. there be, could be some uh, potential for collaboration and mergers as well. But, oh, oh, I mean, and I'm not saying Steve and Nick, although that would be pretty awesome, right? But uh, I think larger companies certainly acquiring smaller companies, maybe smaller to mid-sized companies merging together uh, yeah. could be a possibility as well to continue some of those brands. Of course, we're being, I'm being overly optimistic because I still want to see a healthy amount of new blends and brands coming onto the market. However, it's inevitable that FDA regulation is going to impact that. It is. It's gonna. And we start in the cigarette industry. I think it will be a ten-year roadmap before these consolidations really start. And we've seen it in the airline industry. That's another regulated industry. But I think we're looking at probably at a ten-year point uh, before we see kind of the super giant. And I think eventually there'll be some super giants with brands and subsidiaries un under it. I don't. A lot of people say it's it's a death death march. No. I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't agree. It, I also think what's very optimistic, Will, right. for me is that. Um, the Swedish, Swedish Match bought Drew Estate? Was it Swedish Match? No, no, Swisher. Swisher, sorry, Swisher bought Drew Estate. And that has been, in my observation, and from what I've heard from everyone, a resounding success. And there's a very large company buying, I mean, Drew Estate wasn't a small company by any stretch, but uh, smaller than the acquiring company. And that's gone really well, and they've let them operate independently. And I mean, yeah. you and I have seen this in other industries, Will, right? Like, right. you know, large companies buy smaller companies. I'll use Cisco as an example. Uh, a lot of times that, that brand will suffer, but a lot of times uh, in different scenarios, maybe not Cisco's a, a bad example for a success story there, um, that if that company can still operate somewhat independently and let them have their own culture, that can work. Drew Estate was a great example. Um, yeah, probably the guys at Drew Estate now have to fill out those expense reports mm. with a little more formality, you know, and that's mm. typical what we see. But, I mean, I've visited Drew Estate's offices. I've been to their booths, right? And I can tell you the word agile is, is still very, they're still very loose there. Mm -hmm. They're still very, you know, agile. They're still being allowed to be creative. I mean, I worked into Sam's office, and it's one of those classic, um, like, Bloomberg think tanks almost. Like, it, it's really cool. Yeah. So. You could see, and if anything, it's it's infusing, you know, having some stronger capital capital behind the company. It's probably, if anything, creating that. And Swisher hasn't tried to change the culture, so I right. think that's. I and think they need to be given I, credit with that. I, I think for Drew Estate, uh, Drew Estate business wise, it, it's going to work out for them. Um, who are the two guys we interviewed uh, on Monday? The names escape me at the moment. Juan Cancel and Bill Ives of Cubara Cano. Cubara Cano, right? I mean, here's two guys. They're law enforcement officers. They came out with some awesome blends. I think if they're to be acquired by a larger company, their economics of their business might change some. They might have to take less of a, a take maybe. Um, but I think I'm optimistic that that kind of thing will still go on. It, because it's a trend that I see in uh, the technology industry, the security industry, is that larger companies, like even independent of regulation, larger companies get to a point and it gets difficult for them to be innovative. So what they do is um, they can acquire mediums, like the medium-sized business like Drew Estate, but some of them will go to the extreme and say, you know, we really want that startup culture, and they'll go acquire or fund like the two guys in New Jersey, right, to make cigars. 
Because, I mean, those guys had a great attitude, a great business plan, like the whole thing. There was just a great vibe with them. I think larger companies are going to want to tap into that. And that may be a way that we see some of these newcomers still be able to get into the market. Yeah, look, they may not be. The, yeah, and I think guys, I'm looking at those two guys. I didn't actually have them on some of the list I was thinking. But after the way you just said that, they, they've come out with a great product. They have been a, they put a very cost-effective marketing model, and they've been successful mm -hmm. at it. Um, and they've now come out with two lines that I think have been very good. There's no reason. Maybe the conditions change for how they exist as a brand. Right. You know? Yes. But there's no reason to think, why can't two guys like that be very successful long term? Yeah. And I mean, as far as newcomers go, I know the interview is like fresh in my head. But uh, what was Kubara Kenyo? Kubara Kenyo. Kubara Kenyo. Yep. The protocol. Great cigar. Great attitude. Those guys are awesome. They've done a great job with guerrilla marketing, which is important for any startup right. uh, to have that level of marketing. That's very attractive for an investor to be able to fund you, to be able to have you be a newcomer in the cigar market. You're going to have to have that um, that skill uh, and that plan that's very lean uh, to make it attractive. So, yeah, yeah, you know. You know, and I wonder with some of the, and I'm not trying to pick on these companies because they make great cigars, but, you know, companies like Padron and Fuente, which they've kind of, they don't do guerrilla marketing. They do base, you know, they, they just, they don't, they're, they still do the picture in the magazine ad type of marketing. Yep. I, I wonder how that's going to succeed going forward. I mean, they've been successful at so far longer than I thought. Yeah, but at some point, you know, they don't do any marketing, any press stuff. I, I wonder if that will eventually change. Well, and I think largely, Padron, Fuente, Davidoff, they've been innovative within their own organizations, which is right. really amazing if you think about. It. Like I'm smoking the Padron 90th now. This cigar's awesome, right? So they're able to come out with, you know, it came in a tubo at the cellophane. It's a their first one in the round uh, 1926 series. Like, there's some innovation there, and it's working really well for them. They, I don't, maybe they don't see the need right now. Maybe they're looking in the future and seeing that they, they're not around all that time without being innovative and having some vision, right? Um, they can do that within their own brand. Look at Davidoff, right? Yamasa, Escurio. They're coming out with all these new, new brands. They're almost like boutique brands in and of yep. themselves. Um, I hope that they reach a point where they can kind of reach down and absorb some of these boutique brands so they still uh, are on the market. I don't know that Fuente, Padron, or Davidoff has taken on like a, a boutique brand like that. You would know uh, better David than I. Da Davidoff did with, with Room 101, I think. Yes. Because Room 101 yep, is still right. Matt's brand. It's still yep. Matt's brand. Good example. Good yeah, example. That's probably, yeah, but they have done it. Uh, Padron and Fuente, no. Um, mm -hmm. So, no, but I would say that's the one I would say – you know, I think if, uh, from what I understand, it's Matt's brand because it's through the jewelry. Right. But it, yeah, and, and, and it fits in the portfolio. And I tell you what, uh, Matt's still coming out with great cigars. He's what was the one I smoked on the show? It was a perfect. It was awesome. The, the, the Chief Cool Hour. Yeah. Great cigar. Great yeah, cigar. Yeah, and, and again, there's a combination of personality and, you know, yes. raw, raw materials. You know, we had Chris Topper on a couple. He talked about having the raw materials to be successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're a newcomer, you've got to have the good raw, raw materials to do that. You know, I look at a company like Crux. They're getting great tobacco from Placencia right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, you know, so that's one I look at. So these companies that are getting, the, the, you know, the guy, Brian Moussard from Cattle Baron, he's getting great tobacco through Debonair and the Reyes Factory. Mm -hmm. Um that's why these guys are going to be very successful because ultimately they got to have the raw materials to produce the product. If the product isn't good, then then this discussion we can't even have it. You know. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So what else on this topic, Will? You know, one other thing I'll say is I think companies. I did mention the factory. I think companies that ultimately have control of production and distribution. Um. I'm not saying they may not get acquired at some point, but they're gonna they're gonna be stronger brands. You know, you look at the Roma Crafts. You know, now I look at Black Label Trading Company, and I've seen a Black Label Trading Company since they got the factory. I'm seeing a huge spike in the improvement in their blends. Skip, you know, having his own factory, uh, Nico Sueño, Espinosa. You know, these these companies that have the factory. Um, hey, let's put it like this: they could sell their brands tomorrow, 
and they can still produce cigars for other people. Right. You know, they have really good factories. So mm-hmm. I think they're ones, who, you know, and I think, those, I think you're going to start to see that, Paul. I think you're going to start to see people sell the brands but keep the factory and pr- continue to produce for the people who buy these brands. Yeah, I think what's definitely in jeopardy is like, let's say people like Will and I want to go have their own brand. That's going to be a lot harder. I'm not saying impossible, but it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder. I, and and we, it goes back to what I said earlier. You know, there are going to be people ahead of us in line to get those raw materials, to get on the production uh, schedule in the factory. So it, 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 you forget, FDA fees are going to be another issue, too. But as this industry starts to get tightened up and get consolidated, it is going to get tougher to do that as well. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yep. Well, awesome. I thought that was a great discussion, Will. Was, yeah, I think we got to have more like that. That was a good one, yeah. That was good. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching Stogie Geek Shorts. Every Monday night, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time, check out the main Stogie Geeks show, stogiegeeks.com forward slash live and cigar-coop.com for all the latest news and reviews. Thanks for listening and watching. <laughs>